Karan Sanjeev, welcome to the Process Podcast. Thank you, Ed. It's been a long time. How you doing? Doing good today. Why are you doing good today? It was a solid day. Um, started my day at 4.30. Um, solid four hours of coaching. Had a client, 5.15, fundamental 6.15, two hours of classes. And then it was good that we didn't train in the morning. Um, just did some skill work um, on the gymnastics um, butterfly chest bars. Um, so it was a relatively easy session, just 20, 30 minutes. And then I had an early lunch, had another client at 12.30, and then just finished uh, training with the PM crew. And I'm happy with how that went. Awesome. Yep. We're, we're here today, Karan, to talk about a recent experience that you and I had together. Yeah. Actually, we were roomies in Shanghai. Uh, we, we, we made the trip with the process programming, programming crew down to, up to? Up to or down to? Where is Shanghai, Red Hong to. Kong? Up to Shanghai. Yeah. Um, to compete in the Asian Fitness Championships. Three-day competition. Pretty amazing experience, in my opinion. And I wasn't on the competitive floor. I was the kind of coach and the support team. Um, but just witnessing a competition of that scale and that level yeah. and run as, as well as it was run uh, and also be getting to be a part of it in many ways. You know, the coach, as I said, you know, your bag carrier, um, your confidence and, you know, being able to do some commentary, uh, podcast. It was just all in all a really good experience, and also just seeing the impact that we're having, you know, in this space. We had seven athletes following the who followed the process from around Asia, all travelled down, and we kind of hung out as a big family all weekend, and you know, crushed it. But this is about your experience because this was kind of technically not your first individual competition, but kind of like your first big individual competition, right? Yeah, that's correct. So, um, Ant, I, and Ali Khan did the um, competition in December. Um, in 2022 that was a one-day comp in at asia world expo that was i think three three events um single day comp it was just like seven people so it wasn't too big uh, but this i would count as my first official um crossfit competition because it was overseas it was a multi-day multi-event five events over three days for me um so yeah i think i would count that as my first official crossfit competition so i guess my, my first question yeah is why do you compete why do I compete? Um, I guess I have an overarching goal. The overarching goal, um, I think, has been the same since I first joined Coastal as a member. That was in June 2020. And that was, and that is still to become the fittest in India. So the national champ of India in the CrossFit season. Um, but that just, I think, is very superficial. Um, and that's evolved as the years have progressed. Um, it's more so to push my physical um, limits and to see what my body is capable of. Um, I think, you know, in five years, 10 years time, I don't want to look back at my 20s and early 30s and be like, what if I had done that? And looking at why I started CrossFit, I think that's like the truest expression of fitness, where I think if I was to just do bodybuilding or just powerlifting or just pure endurance and like ultra distances, ultra marathons or triathlons, I think I get bored with that kind of training. And I think CrossFit for me um, feeds all of that. Um, so that's why I picked that sport and just see how much I can push my body um, in that sport and see what I can achieve. And I believe that if I go to my max limit and if I'm the best version of my physical self, I believe that should be good enough to be the fittest in India. Whether or not I get that, that's irrelevant. I just want to see how far I can take this journey. Can I, can I ask, like, how, did you, how did you land on that goal of being the fittest in India? What are, what are, the, are the motivators, deep, deep line motivators that, that are fueling that? Um, I guess so we'd have to dig back into why I started CrossFit. Um, I always knew of CrossFit, um, even three years before I came to Coastal. At that time, I'd never stepped into a gym. So we're talking about um, finishing off third year of university, moving into my final year of uni. I'd never been to a gym. I'd never lifted weights. So I was about 21, turning 22 at that time. And I was really skinny um, compared to now. Um, I was 59 kilos. So at that time, I was looking at my next um, avenue of um, training. I've always, well, I've always had some form of training um, in terms of sports growing up. So growing up, I did swimming, running, tennis. So that kept me busy occupied you know didn't let me fall into any bad habits and that got of sort of bought like a central focus and that discipline and everything that training bleeds into the rest of the, the remaining areas of your life um, and then when i came to uni that wasn't there because um, i played sports occasionally on the weekend so i was looking for something um some form of training some form of discipline 
And that's when I came across um, CrossFit. But at that time, I was really intimidated by CrossFit. And that's when I went down that rabbit hole of YouTube of like watching CrossFit games, documentaries. And that's when I came across um, Coastal and, and yourself. Uh, but at that time, I was like, okay, I'm at university. Let's just go to the uni gym. Let's put on some muscle mass. Let's get stronger. And then down the line, you know, maybe I'll join CrossFit. And at that time, as a uni student, I couldn't afford to... Um, pay a CrossFit uh, gym membership, uh, which was, I think, two and a half K a month, which is quite expensive as a, as a student. So down the line, I just went along with like doing your power building, your combination of like bodybuilding and powerlifting training for three years. And then at 2020, that's when the pandemic started, I guess I went through a breakup and that made me question where I want to take my life. And I came back to CrossFit. Um, as to how I can challenge myself physically. I was looking into uh, break into the fitness space. I was looking at leaving the, the corporate world. I was looking at somehow making it in the fitness industry. Um, I never knew or never expected to end up um, as part of the team at Coastal, but I just knew that, I don't know, I guess had naive hopes of like becoming a fitness influencer. So I left that, uh, I left bodybuilding, powerlifting, and then that was my, I did my research searched CrossFit, went through all the seven, eight gyms at the time that were in Hong Kong. And Coastal for me was the standout. There was no doubt in my mind for three main reasons, I always say. Uh, the community, the coaching staff, and the fact that you have, guys have, we have values. Um, and then I made that shift to CrossFit. And then I chose the most, I guess, aggressive or obnoxious goal out there. And at the time, the national champ qualified for the games. And me watching, um, I guess, the CrossFit Games documentaries, I'm like, you know what? I can't, I can't use genetics as an excuse because national champ, I'm competing with Indians. I have the same genetics as all other Indians. So if kind I of. Yeah, more, yeah, more or less. More you don't or all less, have right. the same mom and dad. That's true. That's true. But I can't be like, oh, because yeah. I'm not, you know, you know what I mean, right? Um, so I'm like, okay, I think if someone else can do that, um, which is why I resonate so much with the values of growth mindset of, you know, if I believe I can do that and I put in the effort and I have that consistency, I can one day be that or do that too. Um, and I still believe in that. So I chose the most obnoxious or like the most aggressive goal out there. And I think if you, if you know me well enough, I like to shoot for overreaching goals or like, you know, shoot for the stars. If you miss, you end up at the moon, which is still a pretty damn good place to be. Um, so I guess it was a very naive or, um, you know, aggressive goal. And that's just at that time, I just needed something um, to focus and put my energy towards because um, I was in 2020, um, going through a breakup um, and I wanted to channel, I knew that I had to work on myself and I wanted to channel all of my emotions, thoughts and energy in a positive um, direction. And I felt that there's no better way to do that than to see how much I can improve at my physical best. Because yeah. I, th I think there's a difference between <clears throat> wanting to see what you can achieve physically yeah. and putting yourself into a competitive arena. Because I think, you know, and we're going to speak about this, but, you know, as you know, there's a lot more that goes into competition than just, you know, how physically talented you are, you know, what you can lift and how enduring you are. So I guess the the question, it go another layer to it is, why not just train really hard? See what you can achieve in the gym uh, versus, you know, signing up to the biggest competition in China, you know, flying down, paying for your own air tickets, you know, stepping away from work, doing something that is really stressful, uh, you know, why, why pursue that? What, I, is, what does that give you? I think I'm just really just scratching the surface right now. I'm at the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more when you do compete. Um, In terms I've, of always, I've always been competitive. Mm -hmm. um, I've always played um, sports competitively at a school level, uh, representing my school, um, or whether it be at university level, I've played competitively for swimming and running and tennis. So I have that competitive nature. Well, and you I played think competitive tennis <laughs> back in school. Oh, just so everyone knows I beat, I beat Karan in tennis. I didn't play competitively. <laughs> Sorry, continue. That's because you are in my head rent, <laughs> rent free, unfortunately, but that actually goes, that feeds into this, mm -hmm. right? Um, talking about like, um, your opponent occupying your headspace rent free. I think competition um, brings out brings that out in you, like mental fortitude and how much how much else it takes, like mindset, strategy, nutrition. I mean, we're gonna dive into all those topics, but it 
it, it's so much more than just training because at that highest level, which I'm not at the highest level, but when I see, um, you know, you guys, when I see Ant um, competing at the semifinals to make it to the games, everyone, at least the top five, eight athletes at the Asian semifinals, at least, are worthy of a game spot. But what separates the top two, three is the smallest details and how much that goes into it in terms of mindset, strategy, you know, in between events, long term as well. And I think I want to challenge myself um, to do that. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess I am an adrenaline junkie. Um, I think I get off off competing um, or that feeling, um, you know, and I want to see, I also want to see how I am in the face of adversity uh, when something does go wrong, you know, how I bounce back. I think, I think that's a true test of character. Um, so I think that's the only way we can grow and evolve as humans. So, you know, if I win, I've, I enjoy that feeling. And if I lose, there's so much to learn from and I want to see how I bounce back. And I know I'm going to grow um, irrespective. Yeah, I love it. So, so I guess in summary, if I was to repeat that back to you, um, it's not just the physical endeavor of doing, you know, hard physical training, but it's, it's the learnings and the lessons that come from putting yourself in high pressure situations, seeing if you can handle it. And if you can't, well, what do you learn from it? And how does that then also, also seeing the carryover from that into other aspects of your life? Exactly. I don't think you could have uh, nailed that better. Um, initially when I first started training, it was all about, you know, physique or, you know, pure strength numbers, very naive things in my opinion. Now, now for me, training is so much more than that. It's for me mentally and emotionally, how much, how much that does for me is way more. Um, so yeah, I would say, I would say it's that. So, so why did you pick Shanghai? Why did you, why did you decide that this, this mega competition was yeah. going to be your first individual one? Um, well, to be honest, um, I was doing a lot of qualifiers, um, and Ant and Adele, um, did the qualifiers, um, Ant flew out to do, um, qualifier one against, um, Kim SSG, um, to kick off, um, the competition, um, or the online qualifiers. And at that time I was doing, I guess, three main, um, um, competition qualifiers, which would be the Bangkok throwdown, um, Asia fitness champs. Callous and callous games. So I was just going through that phase of one, two months where I was just doing qualifier workouts over the weekends. And then whichever ones I qualified for, um, I would go um, ahead with, and I did qualify for two of the three. Um, and there was no real intention of like, oh, I want to, I want to do AFC because it's AFC. It's just that I picked, um, AFC because Ant and Adele were doing it. Um, and I know like, the entire crew would be going down. You guys would be going down and that whole like camaraderie and I, me coming down with you guys to Korea, I enjoyed that. So I think that, that influenced that as well. And the fact that, you know, Anne told me prior that it is going to be a high level competition. It's not going to be your Mickey Mouse competition. It's going to have like real five hard, seven hard events over multi days. And it's, you're going to have high level athletes there. So that sort of like influenced me as well, but I would have um, gone for, I'm going to Callis as well. And if I made Bangkok, I'd have gone for Bangkok as well. It's just for me to get competitions in the bag and get experience um, competing. You just mentioned the semifinals there. Yeah. Because you know, I went down with Ant to coach him and we had a lot of process athletes also competing in the teams. And, you know, you came down because you wanted to just to experience that. Yeah. I think partly to fanboy Ant, um, but also just to like, you know, be a part of your first major crossfit competition. And, and I found it was really helpful having you there as kind of like an assistant coach to help me, um, you know, help my athletes, but also just, you know, I could just see that you were very um, curious the whole weekend having experienced the semifinals as kind of an expe a spectator and a supporting role was there did that help you then compete this weekend uh last weekend in shanghai was there was there anything for the fact that you'd been a part of that that you then kind of took into this competition experience yes um so Ant made me reflect uh when we had chats about i, I told him something that you know i have no experience to draw upon and he laughed at me and made fun of me and he's like you saw me compete at the semifinals so you know what I did in between events. You were with me the entire time. You saw how I approached warm ups. You saw what I was eating, what I was um, drinking in terms of nutrition um, in between workouts. So that definitely um, did help. And then just watching um, him and watching you coach him in terms of like just how we approached events with mindset, staying calm, staying collected, and how you helped him strategize and how he stuck with the strategy. 
that's a lot of things that I drew upon and tried to um, emulate at Shanghai. Um, so yeah, um, I think, and, and having you there, um, you know, with me the entire time in Shanghai and reminding me that, oh, this is a small, this is, this is, this is a short workout. So you got to be warming up a lot more. And also there's a five workouts over three days. You got to think about the volume. Um, so you just kept reminding me of stuff that I had experienced in Korea at the semifinals. Um, but yeah, I could drop on by being a spectator. Oh yeah, I think this is amazing. A perfect segue to talk about like your learnings from this experience. Um, I want to just start by saying I was really, really impressed with you. And I think most people watching you would not have known that it was your first competition. I think I could definitely see that there was, there is an athlete there who has competed in other arenas because there are a lot of things that athletes do regardless of their sport or discipline that carry over to whatever their next endeavor is, right? And it's like intention, it's focus, it's knowing when to switch on, it's knowing when to switch off. Um, and I saw a lot of like very, you did a lot of things that seasoned veterans do mm. as a competitor. So I just wanted to share that. I mean, I've already shared that with you, but I was really impressed with you. Thank so you. maybe the, the question is, you know, what were the biggest takeaways from this experience as an athlete? I would say um, mindset is the biggest takeaway. Um, Cause for me in the past, um, in the recent past at least, um, in high rocks races, I've let, you know, expectations, I've let um, outside noise um, affect my performance, um, that being cramping up and f not finishing the race or finishing the race at a time that I didn't want to, um, I guess, unexpected results. Um, so mindset and zoning in and going into it without expectations and not letting the outside noise or my own expectations dictate um, my performance in the arena or in the events. And something that I thought about a lot was something you said about you know when we were snatching we just one day was in training and you said focus on the cues focus on you know you have the exact same setup each time you walk to the bar you do your thing so i was trying to focus on the task at hand and nothing else and focusing on my strategy and executing that irrespective of what's happening around me so i think my biggest takeaway is mindset strategy and approaching each event with intention so everything up here i would say is my biggest takeaway yeah it's funny i, I literally just posted i've been doing a thought of the day yeah. on monday to friday which is basically at the exact same point on my walk to work uh which is like i just round the corner from my house and i'm starting to walk towards the mtr in kennedy town i don't know it's always like the transition between finishing work at home and moving coming to the gym mm. that i always feel like i have thoughts that pop into my head probably from what's happened in my morning at work. And this one was about, you know, how do you, how, how can you compete and be as present as possible when you're competing? So we're talking, what we're talking about there is that how can you just focus on the things that you need to focus on in a competition and not the outside noise. And there is a lot of outside noise in a competition, right? You've yeah. got, for you guys, you had, you were televised the whole time. So you had thousands of people watching from afar. You had a live audience there. You had judges, you've got, people next to you racing, trying to beat you, moving faster, moving slower than you. You've got your own strategy you're trying to focus on. You've got, so you've got all of that contributes to nerves, anxiety, fear of failure, excitement when you've got events that you're like really excited to get yeah. into. And all of those things can contribute to pulling you out of the moment. And when you get pulled out of the moment in a competition is where you forget you can't do the actual job, right? You've seen, you know, we, you see this happen where people just forget how to do the thing they've done a million times before. And <clears throat> the ability to compete and be present is a direct, in my opinion, reflection of the ability to live life and be present. Mm. So if you're practicing being present in every aspect of your life all the time, then competing is just another event in your life yeah. that you apply that to. Um, what do you think about that? I agree, um, I'm, but I'm not going to sit here and say that all of my events, I was um, fully present and fully focused. Um, Let's talk about it. So um, events one, three, and five, I'm very happy with my intention, with my strategy and sticking to my strategy. Um, events two and four, um, I definitely got pulled out or I forgot uh, what I was doing. Um, so events one, um, event one was um, the swim event. I think that was a great event to be the first event. Um, it definitely calmed the nerves. It was a winter swim, four rounds of um, 10 cal ski into a 50 meter swim. And then the remainder time of eight minutes, you um, do a max cal um, on the skier. And was that a great event because you're a good swimmer? 
Yes. Um, so I do have a swimming background and I've swam almost my entire life, right from when I was four or five years, all the way up to 10th, 11th grade. Um, so that definitely, that made me, I would say above average swimmer or like a top swimmer, at least in CrossFit. Um, I'd say I was a top three swimmer on, sure. um, in, in the competition. Um, although I finished 11th, that's because um, of power output on the ski erg. Um, so that definitely um, helped calm the nerves. And I was in my zone. I was in my arena because I've, I've walked up to the pool. I've done, I've done 100, 100 plus events in swimming in multiple different schools all around my state. Um, you know, rocking up to the pool, you know, the same thing, like the small little focusing on your cues and your being present in the moment of like me walking up to the pool, dipping my hand in the water, wetting my goggles, wetting my face, um, you know, you know, signaling to God. That's something that I've always done in the pool. And I did that as well, having my shirt on, then taking it off, having my ear pods in. I just felt in the zone. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew I was going to do relatively well in that event compared to other events. And it was easier when you know you're going to do well to stay in the moment and stick to your strategy. And we had, we had spoken about this. I'd worked out the math as to, you know, what pace I'm going to hold in the ski erg. That's all I had to focus on. Am I holding that pace? Okay, I've held that pace. I've hit the 10 cal. We practiced transitions from the ski erg into the water. We practiced the flip. We practiced getting out of the water. I know what kind of cadence I want to hold on my on my 50 meter swim. And so when you break it, when you break down the eight minute workout and you don't know exactly what you need to be doing at each second, you're focusing on the now or the power of now. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Right? It's basically you, you created your process, yeah. which is these are the things that I have to do in order to create the, the best outcome. Yeah. And you let the outcome take care of itself. Let's talk about event two because it's so it's, yeah. it's interesting because some context we were sharing sharing a room right yeah. so we spent the whole weekend together it wasn't actually a weekend monday to wednesday yeah but we had an opportunity to reflect on every single event and it was funny hearing you seeing you execute event one and having the reflections of almost like this is easy yeah like this competing shit's easy like just be present and you nail it and then you know the next event we had kind of like an opposite experience right yeah so please share so event two was um, Spartan Sphere. Um, so the event was starting with a 160 meter Husserfeld bag carry um, at 80 kgs, moving into seven rope climbs, then a one mile run, four laps, 400 meters, back into seven rope climbs, and then again, finishing off with a 160 meter um, Husserfeld bag carry at 80 kgs. Which is basically like a gravestone sandbag. You have to yeah. Carry, yeah. yeah, and we did this in at, at Coastal. We ran a simulation um, similar to it, um, Ant and I. And there was already fear going into it, right? What's that fear? The fear was a sandbag. Um, the sandbag for me is quite heavy. Um, 80 kgs is 10 kgs more than my body weight. So I already was afraid of the event. And that's can not I, a... Can I just pause you there? What were you afraid of? How hard the bag was going to be or the fact that the bag was hard for you and therefore what that would mean to your placing? How hard... I mean, I'd say both. Um, how hard the, the bag is going to be and I knew that's just going to drop me down and I'm not going to be probably going to be in the bottom half. Um, you know, it's going to be a drastic um, difference from event one. Um, and when you start off the competition in 11th place after event one and you, you see yourself, um, you know, in a, in a higher heat, even though they didn't reorder the heats, but um, you see yourself in event two, you're the last one to finish the sandbag. Um, I still stuck to the strategy of wanting to go 30 meters, 30 meters, and then go 20, 20, 20 to finish it off. Um, but when we did it in simulation, we did a 70, I had 70 kg, uh, a D ball. Um, and the 80 kgs was definitely uh, a big game changer, but it was easier to hold the user for the bag compared to the D ball. I will say that. But when I did get to the rope climbs, I was now, I was now no longer present in the moment. I got pulled out. The first seven rope climbs was a shit show. Cause it I was like, you'd forgotten <laughs> how to climb a rope. Yeah. We, we went, you taught me, you know, how to descend from the rope. We practiced that we were going to be two clamps, touch the, touch the metal V bar and then one drop and then jump down. I was all over the place because I got to the rope last in my heat. And that's all I was thinking about that. I wasn't even thinking about what I had to do. And I was, wasn't even doing two clamps. I was doing two and I was, the reason why was 
I wasn't reaching on the, after the first clamp, I wasn't reaching all the way up. My hands were half shortened. And I only realized that when I was reflected on the run. I was like, why wasn't I able to touch after two clamps? So I, I was all over the place. Um, and I was just thinking, I just didn't want to be there. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's just a 25 minute AMRAP. Let's just see how far I can get through. I was already coming up with, instead of focusing on the task at hand or like what I needed to do, I was coming up with excuses or, you know, okay, this is, we know this is going to be a bad event. Less, it's, I was already over in my head, like I already mentally checked out again, um, which I did not. Isn't it funny though <clears throat> that in coming into the weekend, because you, yeah, you've done things like the CrossFit Open before. You had said explicitly number a number of times that placing is not important, that you're just going to focus on your strategy and do your thing. And it's so funny because I think it's important that everyone hears this because we're all going to experience it if you're ever going to do a competition. That you had a good event right so what we mean by that is that you had a result that was probably exceeded your expectations suddenly you're you have a high placing and how that changes your mindset now right because it creates a mindset that i need to stay here like i want to be here and it feels good to do well on event right for to, to we have this like feeling that people are now seeing us as a good athlete yeah. Right. And we're recognized as like, oh shit, this guy's come out of nowhere. Like, and for you, it's kind of like, you know, the ego is getting a bit inflated. Yeah. And then, then you start operating out of fear of throwing away that, that strong start. Yeah. Right. So you're, you're operating out of fear rather than in event one, you are operating out of like enjoyment and, and creativity and this like hunger to want to attack the workout. When you start to operate out of fear, knowing that you don't want to drop down and move it completely changes the the approach and the mindset that you then, you know, that you go into that workout with. And then, like you said, workout one, having, you know, meticulously planned out the process that was going to allow you to execute the workout and have a great outcome. Workout two was all about the outcome. It was like, I can't be last. Now I'm last. Now I'm doing bad. And it's not about, okay, how do I climb a rope? How do I carry a bag? Where do I break the bag? How do I pace the rope? How do I pace the run? See, even on the run, thinking about the rope climb is like, you're not actually being present on the run then, right? So you're kind of like, you know, almost those are those dangerous moments where you can almost like break into a wall because you're forgetting what you're actually supposed to be doing, right? Which is kind of what happened. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah. Al- I was almost walking. Um, that's probably the slowest I've ever been on a run. Um, I, think, I think my run took me 10 minutes and that was like a 2.30 split for 400 meters and i don't think i've ever been slower than that um i'd say that definitely two contributors the first contributor being i wasn't mentally present mm. i was coming up with excuses and i was coming up i was already rationalizing in my head as to you know if Ant gave me shit or you know if you asked me how that went i was already thinking of what i'd say to you guys mm. you know versus <laughs> focusing on actually just running that's the first thing yeah pulling yourself back and getting yourself back in the race yeah i, I was worried about what others would think and what they would say and what I was going to say to everyone else when they asked me how the event felt versus actually just focusing and running. doing the thing. Yeah. yeah. And the second thing, of course, apart from the mental side, I was actually physically quite beat up in the sense that that, that Yusuf felt bag, you know, affected my breathing. I was breathing really hard. Um, I've never felt that way on a run and my lower back and my hamstring were just blown just from the way I was carrying the bag. Um, so definitely made the run uncomfortable. But I guess if I was more mentally present, that would have definitely um, eased the physical um, difficulties. Yeah, I kind of want to fast forward a little bit through yeah. your weekend because the next event you had a sprint, which you then executed exactly like the swim, like yeah. deeply, deeply present, deeply focused. Knew it was something you could do well at. You know, you're a fast runner, um, and so then and you crushed it and you executed really well. Then the next event, I believe, was Maria. Yeah. Right, and then we basically had a repeat. Yeah. Of the uh sandbag workout right where it was like again you have a good event in your eyes a bad event in your eyes a good event and suddenly you're back on cloud nine you want to like retain that those winning ways and show the world that like this is where i'm meant to be yeah and then you know you have this workout which in your head you had told yourself was going to be damage limitation yeah right which is you know i always encourage people to move away from that language even if yes the actual fact is this is going to be a hard workout for you relative to your field of competition and you need to just do your best i mean to be honest in competition you've got to do your best in every single event um but you know yes you might sit down the leaderboard but the moment you start telling yourself this is a bad workout for me or this is damage limitation again you start operating out of a out of a place of fear yeah. and versus out of a, a place of creativity and you know and hunger and you know when you're playing it safe 
is very different to attacking right yep. and it's like we see it in in sports all the time the team that plays safe is often the team that starts capitulating it and not playing good whatever the sport is versus the team that's out to win you know they're playing a very different form of the sport yeah. um so it was really interesting to see you flip-flop between those two extremes back and forth in your first four events because it was like two really big extremes right yeah. so i think the event that i was most impressed with for you was the next event which was a snatch event yeah right which on paper again when you look at the movements relative to your capability should have been a tough workout for you relative to your field of competition i think those words are i'm choosing my words carefully yeah. so i'm not saying a bad event but relative to your field and where you wanted to be which was making the cut for yeah. event six right so you had to think about placing a little bit here um because i feel like in that event you took the learnings from events two and four where you didn't execute you weren't present you got into your own head and you applied it to a workout that was just as hard for you as the other two, but you actually executed. Do you want to share? Would you agree with that, Fursi? I agree with that, hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, what were you? What? What? Tell me through. Tell me. Tell me about that event. Walk me through it. Yeah. So, um, like you said, um, coming into the weekend, I had uh, or the or the or the three day competition. I had no expectations, but expectations started to form as I went through the events and as I saw myself climb up um, the heats towards the second, uh, the top top two heats, right? Um, and then what helped me, um, execute in event five was basically the end of the day. Um, the first thing was having you there and basically just dumping all my thoughts and just sharing everything that was on my head as to everything that went right, everything that went wrong, what, what I'm feeling. And then you giving me your advice and helping me, I guess, rationalize it. And then just me then drawing a line. And then once I stayed up <laughs> in bed and posted on Instagram, that was me. Closure. Closure. And then I move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. I think the end of the day, I came, I always come back the next day with a fresh perspective or a, you know, thinking as though this is day one, this is event one. And I think that definitely helped. Um, having, having event two and event four as a second event of that day and coming off of the high, I guess I got that would have led to me being pulled out of the moment, um, thinking about, you know, trying to be in the higher heat or making the cutoff. Um, so the, I think that's the first thing of like, you know, having you there and being able to reflect and then draw a line and then move on. And I think the second thing is I had a solid plan um, for event five, just like I had for the winter swim event, which was I had to hold the space on the rower. You run up or jog up to your box I know the cadence that I want to hold on the burpee box jumps. I know exactly how I'm going to turn on the box and I'm going to turn off the jump. And then I knew exactly that I'm going to go fours and threes on the snatches. So once I knew exactly what I needed to do, I, I knew the people around me were passing me, but I knew that that's what I could do because we went through a simulation where I did two of the three downs in practice. And I just knew that's where I'm at. And anything more would probably result in me blowing out. And I knew exactly what I had to do. So I broke it down um, by three minutes by three minutes. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to stick to the But at the plan. end of the day, there was, doesn't, just because you had a strategy doesn't mean you could have done it right because you had strategies for the other events as well. Yeah. But the difference was that it was, it became not about anyone else yeah. or anything else. And it was like, you were just laser focused on what you had to do. And then, you know, wherever the chips will fall at the end of that, you were going to be happy because yeah. you just got to do what you got to do, right? Yeah. I, I think we should talk about that, you know, the reflection process because I think it's a very important part of navigating competition, which is, it really depends on the way the, for, the competition has been laid out, right? If you have the ability to, let's say do an event and you have three, four hours between, and then you have another event, then that gives you opportunities to reflect on each event, yeah. right? If you have like back-to-back -back events with not much space, then it's better to actually just get it done you know, which it basically means like blocking thoughts out of your head, getting the job done, and then basically doing this big reflection process at the end of each day. But I do think the key is that reflection process. And I think the things that I see athletes do too much is they sweep their feelings, emotions under a rug, right? Because they can see it as being potentially negative, or perhaps it's just the way they are in, in life in general mm. is right. They don't, they don't sit with their feelings and thoughts and instead they suppress them and they come rearing their ugly head every now and then in life. But I think a really important part of being able to move on from an event in competition is to have that thought process, right? Where you, 
where, where maybe it's journaling if you're someone by yourself you know if you have someone that you feel comfortable talking to thought dumping and just like getting everything out there trying to rationalize connect the dots and understand why something happened and then that gives you the ability to create closure and then move on for it but i think if you don't do that what you end up doing is you carry the baggage with you yeah. with every next event and then you know that's when your head's a complete scramble especially in a three-day competition right three big days like it's hard in the body it's hard in the mind if you're carrying that emotional weight and not processing it and not getting closure from it not learning from it into your last day i honestly think that's such a massive contributor as to why athletes cannot execute on day three of competition yeah what are your thoughts I agree with that. Um, I think just by nature, I'm very reflective. Um, I don't journal, but I, I do reflect on a lot of things in my life. Um, and the way I reflect is I either sit with my thoughts um, in the sauna or I'm just listening to whatever kind of music I want to listen to and I'm just letting my thoughts flow in and out. Or I thought dump on someone that I'm close to, um, whether it depends on, I guess, context or yeah. the what matter at what hand. your thought dumping, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I agree that for me, I need to be able to reflect and come to a point of closure where I can then move on to the next day or the next event. Um, it was definitely hard to do that, or I didn't have to do that um, within the day because I did have my first event of each day was really good. So I didn't really need to um, reflect as much. It was like a win. I could do that at the end of the day. Um, and I was, um, I guess, a little bit um, occupied with other things as well um, on the day. Uh, but it was important for me to make sure that I rationalized everything, I reflected and moved on before the start of the next day. Yeah, I think another another part to that is that, you know, we know how how taxing your our thoughts can be, right? And so <clears throat> closure allows you to process and move on from a thought without closure what ends up happening is that these thoughts and ideas and feelings ruminate in our head all day all night in a competition and the end of the day we need to be reserving as much energy as possible for doing workouts and recovering from workouts yeah. if we're spending excessive energy on worrying about things like our thoughts or feelings and and not processing them then that is another huge contributor which takes away from your ability to compete and especially multi-day competitions right everyone feels yeah. great on day one everyone can handle physical and emotional stress for a day can you handle it for two days it gets a bit harder can you handle it for three days that's where people start to crack right and it was like yeah. when you're when you're carrying disappointment with you even carrying like elation and wins right you know i was always taught like you know don't hold on to your wins and don't hold on to your losses for too long you know have those moments to celebrate them have those moments to grieve them um but if you carry those things with you you know for hours on end it's just you're burning through your energy reserves which is going to leave you with nothing left to actually do the workouts i never thought about um you know the happiness or the elation side of things of like you know not carrying that on as well um that's something interesting that i need to think about and reflect on because that i definitely was on a high after each of the first events of day one and day two um and i think we can also expand that to not just uh, one single comp three days i think we can expand that to you know months or years of competing yes of like actually coming to a closure and like not just sweeping under the rug because then that can rear its ugly head in future competitions or the same thing might happen that's what happened to me in high rocks mm -hmm. right i think it's more a psychological thing and mental thing um which is why i now know that actually not just competing right and anything even in relationships or uh, you don't you don't want to sweep small things under the rug because then those things will come manifest, up yeah exactly it's and they'll also mani bigger. manifest themselves in the most stressful situations yeah right where you don't have your guard up and they will just come out and you cannot do anything to control them yeah so it's much better to address them when you are i guess more relaxed or more calm cool collected and you can actually get to the root of the issue root of the problem and solve it at that layer versus just sweeping under the rug and then it's just going to turn up in a i guess worse form or you know yeah yeah, yeah what, what i mean by like don't ride the highs and don't ride the lows too long is that i know you know feel, the feelings of elation and a high are very different to feelings of you know um being on a low and you know being upset 
but the physiological response that's happening in our body is the same, the same as right? As it's as elevated as heart rate. It's a cortisol spike. Yeah. Um, it's adrenaline. It's sweaty palms. It's increased breathing rate. And like, you know, we know we need to, we know that all of that stuff burns our reserves, yeah. right? So I think another another part to, to add to that though, is what I'm not saying is I'm not saying don't celebrate wins. And I'm not yeah. saying don't grieve losses. Yeah. Because I also think that's really important, but you just need to be aware that you can't do it for too long. Yeah. Right. So I think it's really important that you celebrate when you do something really good and like have those moments because I think that's what makes competition so fun. If you're suppressing yeah. the ability to enjoy a moment, then you kind of look back on the experience and you're like, well, why did I, what, what did I get out of that? You know? Yeah. So when you have those like, those great results in the swim and you got those great results in a sprint, like you should give yourself that moment afterwards or whenever to, you know, to celebrate it with your friends and, and, you know, relive those moments, but acknowledge that, okay, next job, right? Move, you got to move on from it. And I think at the same time, what I probably see more, and I see a lot of coaches do this is they try to tell their athletes to suppress their feelings mm. of being upset and grieving a poor performance, right? Which is like, you know, just, just get over it or, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Or, you know, no, you, you actually didn't do that bad. You know, like, you know, falsifying what's actually happened. I do think that in order to process anything, you have to be real mm. with the way that you feel about it. And so that's something that I've definitely learned as a coach, you know, being there for athletes is that, you know, when I'm seeing someone going through a hard time, the younger, more immature coach would have tried to talk them out of it yeah. and tried to just make them feel better. And now it's actually recognized that I just need to be there for this person and allow them to just move through this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if I can facilitate that by showing empathy and, you know, asking questions to help them process it more, ultimately, if we can get to the point of moving through it faster, that's that's the win. But the only way you're going to move through it is to actually feel it yeah. and experience it. Yeah. And like you said, right, um, I think there's a time and place for that as well. Depends on how close the events are and how much time you have as well. And then just separating feelings and facts being subjective versus objective. And I guess one thing that I would take away from, I guess, my reflections or the way I reflected upon and got closure um, in this competition, I would say is I think I prolonged it um, where I stayed up quite a bit at night. Um, I think I'd need to find a um, faster way or, you know, not spend hours at night thinking about it or even after I spoke with you until I put my, my Instagram post at like 10, 11 p.m., that's when I'm like, okay, that's done. So I think um, being a bit more efficient with that reflective process um, and I guess, yeah, be subjective and objective feelings versus data, both are important. Um, and then as a coach, um, definitely time and place and I guess empathy it depends on your relationship with the athlete, whether they're looking for your advice as to how you can help them or you just want to ha want to have a listening ear. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so, so often an athlete will let you know when they want your yeah. advice. Right. And often it's just listening. Yeah. I mean, every time I gave you advice was because you said, have you got any thoughts? Yeah. Or, you know, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, and that would always come after a period of you basically just venting and Everything. just getting things off your chest. Yeah. Um, and, and half the time we process things ourselves, you yeah. know, more than half the time, I didn't have anything to add that you hadn't already yeah. worked out. And it was just validating like, yeah, I agree yeah. with, I agree with everything that you're saying. Like, and when I think when you give people space to actually just truly express and share, you know, we, we know the answers yeah. as to, we know why we do the things that we do yeah, I mean, and you know, we know what, what we, we need, need to, to do. do. Exactly. Yeah. I've loved this. I love talking about mindset. Yeah, right. I and too. I think this is like, for me, what has always gravitated me towards competitions and a part of a big part of that, you know, if I put myself in my athlete, athlete shoes was because as a young athlete, as a professional athlete, this was a side to sport that I always really struggled with. Mm. And I felt like I didn't have the tools to be able to navigate them, nor could I connect the dots as to why I would have bad performances. I would just put it down to having a bad day. Right. And that led me on a quest to want to understand the mind more yeah um so i could just figure out you know how number one i could compete better and actually showcase the physical capacity that i have but also in going through that process of learning about the mind it brought me back to every memory from you know under sevens rugby up until you know representing the national team as an adult 
where I, I had experience experiences of things like performance anxiety or, you know, mental. And those those mental experiences have like cemented themselves in my head because I never processed them. Mm. And like, you know, because I never dealt with them, because I never understood them. And that just goes to show that was over 20 years ago. And those yeah. things are still etched in my memory. Yeah. And it wasn't until I started understanding you know, the mind and how that could, you know, manifest itself in competition that I was actually able to create closure on a match that I had playing for Hong Kong when I was 13 years old. Decades ago, yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah. And then, and now being able to do that as a coach has mm. been amazing. Yeah. I think for me as well, I just want to see how much I can push my mind. I think, I think the body can achieve a lot more than we give it credit for. And I think the mind holds us back. Um, so I think, I think that's what separates um, the elite athletes, that top 1%. Um, I think they're all at physically, they're all more or less the same. And it's the, the mindset uh, or the, the mental aspect of competing that makes that one second difference or one rep difference. Yeah, I think they say when the, when the body wants to quit, the mind's only at 50%. Yeah, yeah. And I think about that all the time. I read an amazing book called How Bad Do You Want It? Yeah. Um, have you read that book? No awesome it's a, it's it's i can't remember the author um but it's really about the endurance the endurance community and basically mm. just talking about like the power of mind yeah and i always remember a lot of quotes from that book you know when i'm doing like aerobic training yeah. um or i'm competing that it's like you can always do more yeah and there's a very 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 big difference between going hard versus going very hard yeah versus going very very hard yeah versus going all out mm. you know most people actually have never experienced very hard or even very very hard or even all out like we see it when people really truly do that yeah and it's like they are collapsing and basically almost dying on the competition floor having to be stretched off and then you know awaking from consciousness hours later like that is yeah probably a more true expression of you know how far the human body can really go before yeah. it decides to stop yeah i don't think my i myself have experienced um pushing hard or very, very hard. I think, um, I believe I'm still barely scratching that surface. And, you know, we, I always go back to David Goggins and, you know, stay hard mentality. For me, it's more about the long run um, and just seeing what my mind, how much I can push, not just my body, but my mind as well. And I'm, I think I'm just barely scratching the surface with that. Love it. Yeah. Karan, we're going to finish this episode with some quick fire questions. <laughs> Let's go. I'm trying to shout out to, to Mr. I can. Mr. Twazon, who helped construct these questions. Let's go, Twazon. Uh, so remember, these are yeah. quick fire, uh, which means don't dwell on it. First okay. thing that comes to your mind, okay. and things like it depends, maybe, are not options. <laughs> okay. So I will call you out if you go down that route. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're referring to the AFC, the conversation we just had. Question number one. Yeah. What is the moment that you look back on with the most amount of regret? Maria, um, getting carried away um, with what's happening around me. I got pulled out of my pacing. Um, I wanted to hold a 3.30 pace or 3.40 pace. I ended up finishing my first two rounds in six minutes, which is a three minute pace. And then getting carried away with my judge no repping me and miscounting a few reps. I was not present at all. Um, quick fire done. done question number two what is the moment that you look back on with the most amount of pride event three I was had so much anxiety over those hurdles and just me conquering those hurdles yeah event three just so you know if I was to do that event you'd beat me that <laughs> I genuinely that. don't think I could get over that hurdle uh, question number three favorite picture of you from the competition um, <laughs> me me um, on um actually me diving into the pool me diving into the pool or me just standing and staring at the um at the sandbag <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty 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 cool picture question number four one competitor that left a strong impression on you uh i think i've already shared this um with twazan it's, it's chris twazan me too yeah just him turning up <laughs> 10 minutes before the competition competing in the women's heats and just how much he put his body through and how much energy zero prep, zero prep. he wasn't supposed to do it one month he had written it off and how much energy he bought not just for himself and him competing but for the process just unbelievable by the way he's a mess right now 
<laughs> yeah, he's, he's not yeah. been training for a, yeah. He's now one week post comp and he is he said he's now feeling all the feels post competition. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh but I'm gonna also say expected. uh yeah. Chris was my what my inspiration. Yeah. He's still with my inspiration. Question number five best recovery food that you ate. Uh I don't think I ate the best during those three days. It's, got, gonna say, it's gotta be your breakfast, surely. Yeah, I was gonna say pancakes <laughs> and waffles. It, so, with the chocolate syrup. So just to expand it, Karan every morning had a plate of pancakes and waffles with chocolate sauce, like a lot of chocolate sauce. And then you would dip your meats into your chocolate sauce after. That was a bit weird. And then, right. and then the justification was like, come on, guys, I'm competing. I need the cars. Well, like, yeah, fair enough. And then the day after competition, no more competing, just flying home. What does he have for breakfast? Protein dips and chocolate sauce uh, with waffles and pancakes. It was good, though. I enjoyed them. <laughs> okay. Six, what was the worst recovery food you ate? probably i guess the ice cream at the end of the day why um i guess it definitely i guess I, on some scale i am lactose intolerant um i think and i am i have the nerves and i had definitely had the shits during competition and i think that might have uh just made it worse and maybe was that i think that might have contributed to your help dreams <laughs> <laughs> so just, just for some context <laughs> by the way guys so karan decided to film me snoring <laughs> in the middle of the night and if i do sleep on my back i do snore and then what i what i then reminded karan of the next morning was i woke up at about two o'clock in the morning and all i could hear was help help so i i, I was sleeping with the earplugs in and i took the earplugs out and i was like hey, maybe he needs my help <laughs> so i, I kind of sat up and listened and this help just got a bit louder help help and by by help five it turned into Help! <laughs> I do not believe this. One hundred percent. I have I have video audio proof of him snoring. He does not have proof of this. I will I will get proof of you uh, seeing help. Next question. Um, question seven. Everyone gets an entrance song when they get introduced on the competition floor. What's yours? The one that comes to my mind right now is remember James the name. <laughs> no, no, definitely You're beautiful. not. This is, this is my, definitely my top three song all time, but I think Remember the Name by Fort Minor. Um, I don't know. That's just a song that's coming to my head right now. Nice. Yeah. Best moment, best in moment advice that Ed gave you. <laughs> best in moment advice. I think I always kept going back to focus on the cues. Um, I always, um, at least in events one, three, five, be present, focus on the cues. That, that, I think that's something that'll stick with me, um, irrespective. Um, I can't think of anything you told me during on the day, but it was, yeah, focus on the cues, focus on the job at hand. Worst in-moment advice that Ed gave you. <laughs> the hurdles. You stitched Kobe up and you told me the same thing as well for the pylons. You told me it was the wrong direction uh, or the wrong turns. It was left foot in, right foot in, left foot in. You told the exact opposite. But to be fair to you, you told me, go check with the judge uh, just before going on. And I double checked uh, when I went on. Did right. In fact, before you went out there, I said, actually, I think it's right, left, right. Yeah, said, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was shit. <laughs> um, okay. Question 10. What is a process athlete? What is a process athlete? I think that's the mission that we have here at The Process, which is um, community and relationships. And for me, these were two times, um, Korea and Shanghai, where, because it's easy, like you said, very easy to get um, into, our, into a bubble here at Coastal. But for me, going to Korea, going to Shanghai, the impact we're having and the difference, like you say, between all the other CrossFit programs out there is the community aspect and building that relationship with these members. And for me, that's become a huge thing. And I've been enjoying that. Like now I do, I connect with the coastal community back home with what's happening there, but I've also like interacted with, with the process teams and athletes and members there. So I think connection, relationship, community. Love it. Yeah. Karan, it's been an absolute pleasure, my friend. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for having me.